Well, the scripture about Elijah, he goes to the mountain of God on the Sinai Peninsula to find God. He's worried because he's been threatened by Jezebel with his life. He's going to die. But he doesn't find God in the usual places. We usually think of God in the wind. Perhaps God in the shaking of the earth or in fire. And yet Ezekiel finds God in none of these. But God comes in a still, small voice, in silence, sheer silence. God then speaks. So today we're speaking about experiences of God. And so Elijah's experience of God was different from what he was expecting. And the message he got was different from what he was expecting. He thought that he would find sympathy from God saying, yeah, you've done a good job. Everyone else has been killed and you're, you're alive. Good for you, Elijah. You know, you've done a great job. So God instead says, go back. Go back to where they were and do your job. Now, the one coming up from Genesis is another encounter with God that uh, Jacob has. So we have Genesis 32, 6 through 12, and then 24 through 31. Messengers returned to Jabbok, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and camels into two companies, thinking, if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Remember to return to your country and your kindred, and I will do you good. I'm not worthy of the least of all of the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. Now, Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Penuel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. So we see in this other chapter from the Bible, Jacob wrestles with God. And that essentially is what most of our faith is about is wrestling with God. Yes, there are times when God comforts us, when God gives us some solace in life, when God gives us peace. But then, most of the time, we're wrestling. Oftentimes, because of our own, our own unpeace in our lives, the discomfort we have that we create, oftentimes from our own ego striving. And so we struggle, we wrestle with God to try and come to terms. And God does bless us, even though we might get our hip out of socket once in a while. God still blesses us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask for your, your Holy Spirit to be upon us, to guide us, 
in the reading of Scripture. Help us to understand your ways, God, for we are here to encounter you, to understand your ways. And we stand in the cave like Elijah, wanting to hear a word from you. Help us, Lord, when the word that you give us isn't what we quite expect. And God, help us to continue to be faithful, to, to continue to wrestle with you and to receive your blessing, just like Jacob. Lord God, be with us this day, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, many churches in recent decades have looked over their aging congregations and wondered why they are declining in numbers. They wonder what happened to their once vibrant worship and their social center of their community. They wondered what went wrong. With twinges of guilt, they wonder what they did wrong that their children and grandchildren no longer go to church. People focused on what could be wrong. Well, people came up with all kinds of reasons and who to blame. Hasn't really helped. So Diana Butler Bass, however, tried a different approach than trying to find out what is wrong in assigning blame. She decided to research churches that are vital and growing in what they are doing right. Her study led her to her book, Christianity for the Rest of Us, which has been the source of inspiration for my sermon series on the vital church these last several weeks. Now one of the essential things that Bass found out in all the vital churches was a desire to not just know about God, but rather to experience God. Many of the churches she studied had been dying and near closing until, through various means, they rediscovered the experience of God. And it may seem strange that the church, a church which is dedicated to the worship of God, would be disconnected to God. It seems that many houses of God which are in decline are places where God's presence is absent. Those churches, however, who seek to experience the presence of God are vital. They're alive. They're growing. Vital churches are those who are inviting and showing hospitality to God. Churches become vibrant and vital again by reconnecting with God, by getting to know God personally once more. These essential prob the essential problem, it seems, for the declining mainline churches has been that they do a good job of thinking about God, but they don't do well in experiencing God or personally knowing God. Throughout the last half of the 20th century, the connection between the heart and the head has been dominated by the intellect or the head. The declining mainline churches have been head first in their worship and practice of faith with the heart, meaning feelings, emotions, and intuition all but left behind. This uh, head-heavy approach to faith began in the 1700s and continues to this day. Mainline churches have taken an increasingly scholastic and rational approach to religion. By 1740, there was a great reaction to this rational approach. And religion of the heart grew into a movement that brought about the first great awakening of religious fervor and renewal in America. This religion of the heart then returned again in the second and third great awakenings in the 1800s. And many experts say that we are on the cusp of the fourth great awakening of spiritual renewal and religious transformation. If we were to trace back through history all the various times, all the various times of faith, renewal, and reawakening in Christianity, we would find that the major element in that renewal movement is a re-emphasis of the heart, of reconnecting our faith to our feelings and emotions. Bass wrote <clears throat> that in the vital churches she visited, people spoke of their feelings when it came to faith. They also spoke of experiencing the mystery of God. And when people talk about the mystery of God, they're speaking about an experience of awe, of wonder, and surrender. Bass wrote that the core or the center point of worship is to invite an experience which transforms the heart. We might say that the heart of worship is personal transformation. You see, even our words and phrases points us to the significance of the heart. We say, we want to get to the heart of the matter. You know, we want to get to the heart of worship. And when we refer to the <clears throat> heart of something, 
we are always talking about the most important part of whatever we're talking about. The heart is the center point. The heart is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And that is true of worship as well. But most of us, <clears throat> well, most of us are 18 inches from heaven. The average distance between the head and the heart is 18 inches. And one of the main goals of worship is to connect our hearts and our heads so we may become unified and harmonized once again, so we become a whole person. Many of us are so afraid, however, that our feelings will overwhelm us and will lose control that we overly control or suppress our emotions. We put our heart down, suppress our emotions, and we try to rule or live our lives by our head. The trouble is that creates an imbalance. To live well, to live fully, or one might say to live abundantly, a person needs to have a balance of reason and emotion, a balance of their heart and their head. Our worship of God is meant to have the byproduct of healing the division between our hearts and our heads. And the worship of God is meant to bring us back into a proper balance of reason and emotion. Worship is meant to be healing. Essentially, worship is about celebrating life. We gather in worship to thank God for giving us the gift of life. We come here as a community to celebrate our lives and all the triumphs and tragedies, all the good and bad that we have experienced in our lives. We thank God for all of the, this precious gift. And in similar fashion, we praise God in all God's amazing power and generosity, an awesome God, for giving us the gift of life. So in celebrating life, we need to express that celebration with both our hearts and our heads together. Remember the greatest commandment? We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. <clears throat> In other words, we love God with our whole being. We love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our head. Loving God is the heart of our worship, and it is the heart of our lives. In many <clears throat> worship workshops I've attended, I've been told that a vital worship service needs three things. In order for people to have a worship that transforms their hearts, they need to experience one, laughter, two, sorrow, and three, a sense of awe. In other words, people need to laugh, they need to cry, and they need to wonder at the mystery of God. Now, of course, the approach is not to manipulate people into these experiences, but the goal is to invite people into a sense of openness and attentiveness <clears throat> so they may experience these things for themselves. Notice that all three things for the good of worship experience deal with feelings, laughing, crying, and awe. Yes, I know many of you came here to learn, and you came to learn about being a Christian. Part of what we do here is offer knowledge. Part of what we do here is to teach the stories about God and the ways of God's will. And many pastors believe that if they've done that, well, they've done their job. But the heart of worship is to also offer an experience that touches your humor, touches your sorrow, and touches your awe and wonder even if it is only for a quarter of a second of awe and wonder. Experiencing God is not limited to a church sanctuary. There are many play times and places and circumstances people can personally know God. And each of us is different, and, and what works for one person may not work for another. But here are some of the ways people experience the awe of God. Now, I've adapted the following list from a website from Vanita Hampton Wright. See if you can find some of yourself in it. You become acutely aware of God's presence through an overwhelming sense of peace, gratitude, love, and joy. You suddenly discover an answer that you've been looking for. You experience a rescue from danger or the healing of an illness. You experience vivid awareness of life's wonder, mystery, and beauty. 
You are touched to the core by a work of art or a vista of nature which turns simple appreciation into an occasion for transcendence. You become aware of other suffering which leads you to act, to act and acts of compassion. Another person, for no particular reason, commits an outlandish act of love and kindness for you. You are able to accomplish something beyond your own strength and endurance or your abilities and knowledge. You witness a change of circumstance that seems miraculous. Your spirit is awakened strongly by a song, a passage of scripture, a poem, or a word that someone is speaking. Many people have experienced a sense of awe when looking at a beautiful sunrise or sunset, rainbow, mountains, ocean, lake, some scenic view. I remember an experience like that when I saw the Grand Canyon for the first time and when I went to Cannon Beach. Anthony Flew, who passed away in 2010, was an English philosopher who taught at the universities of Oxford, Oxford, Aberdeen, Reading, and York. He was world famous as a staunch atheist. He argued that people should assume atheism until empirical evidence of God surfaces. <clears throat> well, late in his life, Flew seemed to find that evidence in the complexities of biology and cosmology, and in particular the DNA molecule. And he concluded that there was some intelligent design behind the creation of life and the universe. General Lou Wallace was an agnostic for most of his life while researching the Bible so he could write a book about the falsehoods of Christianity, he had an experience of God. And instead of writing a book about the flaws of the Bible, Wallace wound up believing in Christ. He then wrote a novel, Ben-Hur, which was an expression of his new faith. In similar fashion, C.S. Lewis was an English professor at Oxford University, the author of many acclaimed books, he was an atheist early in his life, but in his late 20s, he began to study and investigate the Bible with the intention of discovering its flaws and exposing them in his writings. <clears throat> in his studies, he became so overwhelmed and moved by what he was learning that at one point, he dropped to his knees to pray to God. At age 30, he was baptized as a Christian. Well, how about you? I imagine some of you have had experiences of God. Do you remember an experience of awe, of wonder, of surrender connected to God? Well, we've got a couple of people who have been willing to say something about that. So come on forward. Come on. You said you would. <clears throat> Judy. Many of you here know that I'm an epileptic. And uh, I have been for most of my life. When I was about 19, 20, I was sitting on my dorm bed saying, why me, why me? Not knowing I was talking to God, just talking to myself, I thought. And I got an answer. And the answer was, if not you, then who? And at the end of that afternoon, when I couldn't pass on my epilepsy to even somebody I didn't like, I was on my way to acceptance. And through the years, it has grown. And today I say, thank you for my epilepsy, God. It has made me a different, a better, a more compassionate person. First, I'd like to reflect on Peter's listing of the opportunities and say all of the above. In the last 10 days, we've experienced all of the above. As most, if not all of you know, last Saturday, Sandy's father, an 88-year-old man who lived a full life, was involved in a vehicle pedestrian accident, and he passed rather quickly. I was just going to 
enduring joys and concerns, share some of that experience with you. And Peter asked me this morning if I would do it at this time in the service. So here goes. I want to preface that with this. Almost everything I say about the God moments, as I said to Peter, both at the emergency room and at the visitation, our beliefs, it's based in faith. I am sure there are alternative explanations based on the head. I choose, and Sandy chooses, to think with our hearts in this case. Here were the moments. Soon after the accident, <coughs> or right after the accident scene, a young couple and their daughter were on their way to the Ingham County Fair. They stopped. They took Sandy's mother under their wing, stayed with her, drove her behind the ambulance to the trauma center at Sparrow, and stayed with her until we got there. I'm sure there are alternative explanations. That was God. We have spoken with that couple on a couple of occasions, and they truly believe that the Lord put them there for that. The outpouring of love and support at the visitation was exceptional. It wasn't something we expected. We believe that was God speaking to us. Finally, and I think I could probably add many more things to this, but finally, or this is not final, this is next to last, this is penultimate. <laughs> at the emergency room, the composure and complacency and clearness of thought that came over Sandy and her mother at that time were truly amazing. Sandy had those difficult phone calls to make to her siblings to her mother's aunt, and she was able to do all of those things, and I was in awe. It was amazing. Finally, another truly amazing experience. During the visitation, the celebration of life at the funeral home, the driver and his wife of the vehicle appeared. <coughs> appeared. They had this sense of fear about them, about how people would receive them. We shared with them. Melva, Sandy's mother, was not concerned about her own well-being or our well-being. She kept saying every day, that poor young man. We brought him into the room. Sandy's mother greeted him with a huge hug. This is God speaking. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. One thing Diana Butler Bass <clears throat> did make clear in this chapter of her book was that in order to have an experience of God, in order to experience awe and wonder and surrender, one has to be open to it. It is almost certain that if you are not open to experiencing the presence of God, and if you are actually, uh, if you're not looking for God, you're not going to find God. All of the vital churches which Bass visited were filled with people who were open to experiencing the presence of God. They were actively seeking the presence through various spiritual disciplines. Of course, to be open to experiencing the presence of God, one has to be open to experiencing one's emotions. To experience God's presence, one has to connect one's heart and head to be able to feel awe, wonder, and surrender. And God, well, God is just waiting for us to open our hearts. Amen.